Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see all of you here this morning to uh, praise the Lord and to pray to Him and to study His Word. Before we begin this morning, I would like to extend a very special greeting to my church in Fresno. Fresno Central Church where I'm going to be preaching this morning on television. And so I wanted to say hello to all of my beloved members. I love you all. Now I'd like to invite you to bow your heads with me as we pray. Father in heaven, as we come to this place this morning, we want to hear the voice of your Holy Spirit. We want to know what your will is for us. We want to know clearly so that we can obey your will and we can live in harmony with what you have revealed. Father, as we study this morning about examining the robe, we ask that you will be present in our midst to instruct us and to give us the capacity and the strength to live in harmony with what we study. And we thank you, Father, for hearing and answering our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. During this series, we've been studying about the robe of Christ. And we've moved, first of all, into the camp. Jesus came to live his life in our midst. And then we followed Jesus into the court where Jesus went to die to pay our penalty for sin. And then in our last sermon, we moved into the holy place where Jesus serves as our advocate or as our intercessor. Now today we're going to follow Jesus into the most holy place of the sanctuary. The title is Examining the Robe. And I'd like to begin by saying that we're going to study a parable of Jesus that shows beyond any doubt that the judgment takes place before Jesus comes and it takes place in heaven before Jesus comes that is going to come forth clearly because Seventh-day Adventists have always taught that the judgment is not simply when Jesus comes for the second time there is an investigative judgment that takes place before the close of probation before Jesus comes on the clouds of heaven and this parable is going to make it absolutely clear now I'd like to invite you to open your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 22 and we're going to read verses 1 through 14. Matthew 22 verses 1 to 14 and then we're going to interpret this very important parable. It says there, And Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables and said, The kingdom of, is, of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son and sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding and they were not willing to come. Again, he sent out other servants saying, tell those who are invited, see, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and fatted cattle are killed and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his own farm, another to his business. And the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully, and killed them. But when the king heard about it, he was furious. And he sent out his armies, destroyed those murderers, and burned up their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. So the servants went out into the highways, and gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man who did not have on a wedding garment. 
So he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. Now let's interpret the meaning of this parable, and we'll do it studying verse by verse. Let's go to verse 1. And Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables and said... Now Jesus spoke in parables. According to the experts who have studied the parables, the purpose of a parable is to teach one central truth, but the details of the parable are very, very important in pointing to that central truth. Now let's go to verse 2. The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king. Now the king here represents God the Father. That's going to become very clear as we study. The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king, God the Father, who arranged a marriage for his son. Very clearly the son is none other than whom? The son is Jesus Christ. Now of course if you're going to have a wedding, you need to have guests at the wedding. You need to send out invitations. And so in verse 3, we find a call inviting the guests to the wedding. It says in verse 3, And sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding, and they were not willing to come. Now the question is, who are these servants that were sent out by God the Father to arrange for the wedding of His Son. The key expression is, He sent out His servants. I believe the answer is threefold as to who these servants were that were sent out to call to the wedding of the Son. Notice John chapter 1 verses 6 and 7. John 1, 6 and 7. This is the first individual who is sent out to invite these people to the wedding. It says there in John 1, 6 and 7, there was a man, and here's the key word, sent from God, whose name was John. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light, who of course is Jesus, that all through him might believe. So who was the first servant sent out to invite this group to the wedding? It was John the Baptist. But there was a second group. Notice Matthew chapter 10 verses 5 through 7. This group was sent out by Jesus to announce to these people to get ready for the wedding because the bridegroom was in their midst. Matthew 10 verses 5 through 7. Speaking about the twelve, these twelve Jesus sent out. See there's the key expression again, sent. Sent out and commanded them saying, now this is important, do not go into the way. That Greek word is translated later on in the parable, highways. It's the identical Greek word. You need to remember that. He says, do not go out in the way of the Gentiles. So the word way refers to going to whom? To the Gentiles. Highway is tr it's translated in the parable. So he says, do not go into the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter a city of the Samaritans, but go, see they're being sent, go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So what is the second group that was sent to call this, these people to the wedding? It was the twelve disciples. But there was another group. Notice Luke chapter 10 and verse 1. Have you ever heard of the group of the 70? Notice Luke chapter 10 and verse 1, and once again we have a key expression, sent them. It says there, after these things, the Lord appointed 70 others and what? Sent them two by two before His face into every city and place where He Himself was about to go. So those who were sent to call specifically the Jews to the wedding, were John the Baptist, 
the twelve disciples and the group of the seventy to call the Jews to prepare for the wedding of the Son, Jesus Christ. But the Bible says that they rejected the message. So what was God going to do? Notice verse 4 in the parable. By the way, keep your finger there in Matthew 22 because we're going to continually go back there. Verse 4, again, He sent out other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner. Now here comes an important detail. My oxen and fatted cattle are killed. At this time the oxen and fatted cattle have been killed. And it continues saying, And all things are ready, come to the wedding. Let me ask you, what is represented in this parable by the killing of the fatted cattle and the oxen? What did the sacrifices in the Old Testament represent? They represented the sacrifice of Christ. At this point in the parable, Jesus has already what? Jesus has died. Notice Isaiah 53 and verse 7. So you see that the sacrifices of oxen and fatted cattle represented the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. It says in Isaiah 53 verse 7, speaking about Jesus, He was oppressed and He was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the what? To the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. So when the parable says that the fatted cattle and the oxen are killed or have been killed, all things are ready, it's referring to something that takes place after the death of Christ. Did God sent additional messengers after Jesus died on the cross? He most certainly did, according to this parable. Now how did they react to this message that was sent for the second time to the same group, to the Jewish nation? Notice verse 5. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his own farm, and another to his business. In other words, some of them simply ignored the invitation. But others opposed it. It says in verse 6, And the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully, and killed them. This is taking place after the death of Jesus. Because the fatted cattle and the oxen have been killed at this point when the additional messengers are sent out. Now go with me to Matthew chapter 23 and let's read verses 34 and 35. Here Jesus is speaking two days before His death. This is in the chapter that has the woes on the scribes and the Pharisees. It's happening only two days before the death of Jesus. And notice what Jesus is going to say is going to happen after His death. It says there, Therefore indeed, I send you, the two days before his death, I send you, what? Prophets, wise men, and scribes. So he's saying, I'm going to send you what? I'm going to send you prophets, wise men, and scribes. And by the way, Luke chapter 11 and verse 49 adds that he would send apostles. Interesting. And how would they react? Some of them you will what? Kill and crucify. Notice, will, future. Some of them you will kill and crucify. And some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. Let me ask you, who were the prophets that were sent to Israel after the death of Jesus Christ? I can mention too, Stephen, who had a vision of Jesus in heaven. And also Silas, who in Acts 15.32 is called a prophet, as well as others in Acts of the Apostles. Who were the wise men that Jesus was going to send? The seven deacons in Acts chapter 6 are called, choose seven wise men to be deacons. And of course the word apostles applies to all of the twelve apostles. Who were the scribes? Well, the primary scribe was Saul of Tarsus. The Bible says that he studied under a very famous scribe called Gamaliel. He sat at his feet, and so the scribe is Saul of Tarsus. 
And notice that Jesus says here in Matthew 23, 34, Therefore indeed I will send you prophets, wise men, scribes, and Luke adds apostles. Some of them you will kill and crucify. By the way, who was crucified? Peter. Was James also killed? You find the story in Acts chapter 12. By the way, who were scourged? Several. Peter, John, Silas, Saul of Tarsus were scourged. And notice it says, and you will persecute from where? From city to city. Let me ask you, who was it that persecuted from city to city? It was Saul of Tarsus until he became what? Until he became converted. And so this is talking about the messengers that were sent to Israel after the death of Jesus Christ. So notice we have moved from messengers before the death of Jesus. We've moved in the parable to the death of Jesus. Now we've moved to the period after the death of Jesus when a new invitation is given to the Jewish nation to come to the wedding of the Son. The Bible says that they rejected the message. They rejected the messengers. And so what happens with the king? Notice verse 7 of Matthew chapter 22. But when the king heard about it, he was what? Furious. What does the king represent? The king represents God the Father. And what did he do as a result? And he sent out his what? He sent out his armies destroyed those murderers and burned their city. What event is being described in this verse? The destruction of Jerusalem in the year 70. Let's read about it in Luke chapter 19 and verses 41 through 44. Luke 19, 41 to 44. Now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known even you, especially this in your day, the things that make for your peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another. And then the reason is given. Because you did not know the time of your visitation. Do you see the chronological sequence in this parable? It begins with John the Baptist, the apostles, and the seventy. It continues with the death of Jesus Christ. It continues with the additional messengers that are sent. Paul and Peter and John and Silas, among others, that present the message once again to the same group that it was presented to first. They reject the message. And so then it takes us to the destruction of Jerusalem in the year 70. So what was God going to do? Notice what we find in verse 8. Then he said to his servants, The wedding is ready. But those who were invited, that is the first two times, those who were invited were not what? Were not worthy. Very important word, the word worthy. Notice Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 and 6. Let's take a look at that word worthy to see who the first message was sent to. Matthew 10, 5 and 6, and then we'll jump down to verses 11 through 15. It says in Matthew 10, 5 and 6, These twelve Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles. I mentioned that word way is the word highway in the parable. So highway refers to the Gentiles. Do not go into the way of the Gentiles. And do not enter a city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. To whom do the first two invitations go to? To the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Not the Gentiles, not the Samaritans. Verse 11. Now whatever city or town you enter, that is in Israel, what do they need to do? 
inquire who in it is worthy and stay there till you go out and when you go into a household greet it if the household is worthy they're going to the lost sheep of the house of Israel let your peace come upon it but if it is not worthy in other words if they reject the message about the wedding of the son let your peace return to you and whoever will not receive you nor hear your words when you depart from that, that house or city shake off the dust from your feet assuredly I say to you it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city did you notice the importance of the word worthy those to whom the message that was given first were not what? were not worthy and clearly Matthew 10 says that those who were not worthy were the lost sheep of the house of Israel now let's go to verse 9 in the parable you know this is kind of frustrating God sends out two invitations to the wedding and nobody responds nobody wants to come to the wedding and so now he sends out another invitation verse 9 therefore go into the highways what does that word refer to when it says go into the highways it means go to whom to the Gentiles exactly see you would never know from the translation that the word way is the same word as the word highway but it's very very important therefore go into the highways which by the way is the way of the Gentiles and as many as you find invite to what? invite to the wedding so now the invitation of the gospel goes to whom? it goes to the Gentiles it goes to every nation, kindred, tongue and people by the way has the wedding taken place at this point yet? does the wedding take place when the first invitation is given by John the Baptist and by the apostles and the seventy? no has the wedding taken place when Jesus dies? No. Has the wedding taken place when an additional group of servants is sent to the Jewish nation? No. Does the wedding take place yet while the Gentiles are being gathered in from every nation, kindred, tongue, and people? Absolutely not. The wedding has not taken place yet. Now let's go to Matthew chapter 8 verses 11 and 12 and talk a little bit more about this message that goes to the highways in other words goes to the Gentiles notice Jesus even during his ministry spoke about this fact Matthew chapter 8 verses 11 and 12 and I say to you that many will come from east and west by the way these are the Gentiles and sit down with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven but notice those who were invited first but the sons of the kingdom who would those be? those to whom the first two invitations went but the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth let's go to Luke 13 verses 22 through 30 this is the parallel passage to the one that we just read in Matthew chapter 8 Luke chapter 13 and verses 22 to 30 it says here and he that is Jesus went through the cities and villages teaching and journeying towards Jerusalem then one said to him Lord are there few who are saved? and he said to them strive to enter through the narrow gate for many I say to you will seek to enter and will not be able when once the master of the house has risen up and shut the door and you begin to stand outside the door and knock saying Lord Lord open for us and he will answer and say to you I do not know where you are from now who is he speaking to here? let's continue reading verse 26 then you will begin to say we ate and drank in your presence let me ask you who were the ones who ate and drank in the presence of Jesus? the Jewish nation and you taught in our streets but he will say I tell you I do not know you where you are from and depart from me all you workers of iniquity 
there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of, the kingdom of God and yourselves thrust out. And then he speaks about the Gentiles. They will come from the east and the west, from the north and the south, and sit down in the kingdom of God. And indeed, there are last who will be first. To whom did the message go to last? The Gentiles. And there are first who will be what? Last. Those who receive the message first. In other words, Jesus is saying that the kingdom would be taken away from those who receive the first two invitations and it would be given to the Gentiles. In fact, let's read about it in Matthew chapter 21 and verse 43. Matthew chapter 21 and verse 43. Very important. It says here, Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be what? Taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits thereof. Unfortunately, the word nation, you would never know that it's the word ethnos, which elsewhere in the New Testament is translated Gentiles. In other words, therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to the Gentiles that bear the fruits of it. By the way, the Apostle Paul was also preaching with Barnabas. And I want you to notice this in Acts 13 and verses 47 and 48. Acts 13, 47 and 48. The Jews are rejecting the message and they're giving Paul and Barnabas problems as they're preaching the gospel. And I want you to notice what takes place. Acts 13 verse 47. Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you what? First. Interesting. But since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. The same word where Jesus says the kingdom will be given to a nation or to the Gentiles. We turn to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us. I have set you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. So now where does the gospel invitation go to? The gospel invitation goes to all the world. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. The word nations once again could be translated Gentiles. And then the end will what? And then the end will come. And so because the first two invitations were rejected, now the message goes to the Gentiles. It goes to the highways, so to speak. Notice verse 10, once again, in the parable, verse 10. It says, So those servants went out into the highways. The same word that's translated way earlier in the parable. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both what? Bad and good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. Question. Has the wedding taken place yet? No. Does the wedding take place while the Gentiles are being gathered in? While people from every nation, kindred, tongue, and people are being gathered into the wedding hall? Absolutely not. The wedding has not yet taken place. Now it's interesting to notice that there's a parable of Jesus that's parallel to this. Did you notice that it says that, that bad and good were gathered? Now notice Matthew chapter 13 and verses 47 through 50. Matthew 13 and verses 47 through 50. This is the parable of the dragnet. You know they used to fish with nets, not with hooks. So this is talking about fishing with nets. It says there in Matthew 13, 47, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and gathered some of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore. And they sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but threw the bad away. Interesting. Let me ask you, what is meant by the casting of the net? It's the preaching of the gospel. 
Didn't Jesus tell his disciples, follow me and I will make you fishers of men? So casting the net is preaching the gospel. But when you preach the gospel, only good people respond to the gospel and come into the church and claim to follow Jesus Christ. Absolutely not. There are good and bad. How do you know who are good and who are bad? There has to be a what? A judgment to separate the good from the bad. By the way, when I was growing up in the country of Venezuela, our family used to take a vacation almost every year uh, at a pristine island called Margarita Island. At that time it was beautiful. Hardly anybody ever went there. Now it's full of hotels and it's full of businesses. And uh, one thing that we would love to do was uh, real early in the morning, about three o'clock in the morning, go to this beach where the fishermen were coming in with their nets. Uh, and uh, you had several boats cooperating and they had this big net that covered a good share of the bay and they would bring in the nets to the shore and then when they got to the shore they had all sorts of things. They had starfish, they had sharks, they had uh, you know catfish, they had all different kinds of fish in the net and they would sit down and they had baskets and they would separate the good fish that w they were going to take to the marketplace from the bad fish because the net gathered all kinds of fish. And so the gospel net, when it goes to the Gentiles, it gathers both good and bad. So how do you know who is good and who is bad? Verse 11, we come to the critical part of this parable now. It says here, but when the king came into what? See the guests. He saw a man there who did not have a wedding garment. Well, let me tell you something about that word see. That word see in Greek, according to the exe exegetical dictionary of the New Testament, means to see regularly, intensive, thorough, lingering, astonished, reflecting, comprehending observation. In other words, he didn't just come in, oh, let me take a look here. No. The word means that he had an intensive, thorough, lingering, astonished, reflective, comprehending observation. And he finds, as he examines the guests, plural. Let me ask you, are all of the guests examined? They most certainly are. All of the guests are examined. And as he is examining the guests, he sees one individual that is present there that does not have on the robe. We're studying about the robe, right? Now what does that robe represent? I'd like to read a statement from Christ's Object Lessons, page 310. Last night we talked about the robe. Actually the last two times that we met together. We noticed that the robe represents the robe of Christ's righteousness that covers our nakedness. But we notice that when we come in faith and when we repent and we confess our sin and we are baptized, not only does Jesus credit His life to us, but our faith is a faith that changes the life. It's a faith that works, correct? And works show if faith is genuine or not. Now notice uh, Christ's Object Lessons, page 310. The guests at the gospel feast are those who profess to serve God. Those whose names, now listen, listen carefully, whose names are written in the book of life. But not all who profess to be Christians are true disciples. Let me ask you, did that guy profess to have the right to be in the wedding hall? He sure did. The net went out, gathered him in, he came in, says, I have a right to be here. But he didn't have what? He didn't have the robe. She continues saying, but not all who profess to be Christians are true disciples. Before the final reward is given, it must be decided who are fitted to share the inheritance of the righteous. This decision must be made prior to the second coming of Christ in the clouds of heaven. For when He comes, His reward is with Him to give every man according 
as his work shall be. It's obvious that if Jesus brings his re reward, that reward must have been determined before. You know, it's common for Christians to say, oh, you know, we're not going to go through the judgment. It's only unbelievers that are going to be judged. The fact is, there's nothing clearer in the New Testament than the fact that everyone will appear before the judgment seat of Christ to see if they have the robe. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10 says, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account for what we have done in the body. In Matthew 12, 34, Jesus says, by your words you will be justified and by your words you will be condemned. Words, actions. Ecclesiastes 12 verse 14 says not only our works but our secret things. It says God will bring to light every secret thing. Revelation 22 and verse 12 says that Jesus comes to reward everyone according to his or her what? Works. In other words, works reveal if we truly have the garment of Christ's righteousness. Because when we have his garment of righteousness, our life will change. By the way, the New Testament makes it clear that everyone who professes Christ is not a follower of Christ. Have you ever read that passage where Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven? By the way, are these Christians? Of course, they're calling Jesus Lord, Lord. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, didn't we cast out demons in your name? That is in the name of Jesus. Did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not perform many miracles in your name? Is he, and Jesus is going to say, oh yes, come, you're mine. No. He's going to say, I never knew you. Depart from me, you what? Workers of iniquity. In other words, they profess Jesus, but their works denied their faith. Have you ever read in 2 Corinthians 11, where the Apostle Paul speaks about ministers who disguise themselves as ministers of righteousness when they're really ministers of unrighteousness? Have you ever read the parable of the wheat and the tares that are together and they're together until the harvest? Have you ever read the parable of the ten virgins? Did the five foolish virgins claim to be followers of Jesus? Yes. Did they have lamps? Absolutely. Was there some oil in their lamp? Absolutely. They claimed to be followers of Jesus Christ. And yet they were counterfeit believers. Because they did not have truly the robe of Christ's righteousness which was revealed in their life and in their actions and in their words and in the secret things of their hearts. Christ's Object Lessons, page 310. You ought to read the last chapter in Christ's Object Lessons. This is a spectacular chapter where Ellen White is talking about the robe. This is what she says. It is while men are still dwelling upon the earth that the work of investigative judgment takes place in the courts of heaven. The lives of all, did the king examine all of the guests? Absolutely. The lives of all his professed followers pass in review before God. All are examined according to the record of the books of heaven and according to his deeds. The destiny of each is forever fixed. She says in Christ's Object Lessons, page 312, righteousness is right doing and it is by their deeds that all will be judged. Our characters are revealed by what we do. The works show whether the faith is genuine. Now you're saying, Pastor, are you perfect? Far from it. All of us have struggles with sin. But as long as we're repentant, we say, Lord, I'm struggling with this sin. Give me the victory over this sin. And we hate sin. Amen. Jesus does not forsake us. And He will give us the victory over sin. Notice what Ellen White says in volume 2 of Selected Messages, page 380. She's in perfect harmony with Scripture. We've already noticed it in the Bible. She says, that which God required of Adam before his fall was perfect obedience to his law. God requires now what he required of Adam. Perfect obedience. Righteousness without a flaw. Without shortcoming in his sight. God help us to render to him all his law requires. We cannot do this without that faith that brings Christ's righteousness into daily practice. Amen. Powerful. 
You see, the robe of Christ's righteousness is His imputed righteousness, but when we truly have His robe of imputed righteousness, our life will reveal it. Because His imparted righteousness, as we're going to speak about in our next sermon together, will be revealed in our life. And so this man is found in the wedding chamber without a garment. Let me ask you, is this talking about something that happens after Jesus comes? Do you actually think that after Jesus comes, you know, God's people are gathered in heaven, and Jesus comes and says, How did you get in here? What are you doing here? Of course not. When Jesus comes, He's going to take only His faithful children home. Which means that in the parable, the examination of the guests takes place before Jesus comes, and it takes place in heaven. It's through an examination of the books. You see, I'm in two places at the same time. You say, have mercy, one of you is enough. <laughs> I'm in two places. Personally, I'm here. But in heaven, I'm written in books. God has an exact transcript of me up there. And so in the judgment, when God calls me before the judgment seat, He opens the books which have an exact transcript of me. And by the way, Jesus is personally in heaven, and on earth He is found in 66 books. So I am in books where I am not personally. And so this individual was actually in the book of life. He claimed Jesus as his Savior. But when the records of his life are examined, it's shown that his faith was counterfeit that his repentance was not genuine, that his confession was really crocodile tears. Are you understanding what this parable is saying? Does the wedding take place before all of the guests are in the wedding chamber? Absolutely not. By the way, does the final judgment take place when everyone is in the wedding chamber? Absolutely. The judgment finishes with the judgment of the living, and then you have Jesus marrying humanity. That's what, the, that's what the wedding represents. It's when Jesus takes over His kingdom because His kingdom is made up. In other words, He already knows who all of the subjects of His kingdom are. And so now He can marry humanity because all of His subjects have been gathered together in the wedding hall. Amen. Now notice what we find in verse 12. So He said to him, Friend, Notice he doesn't say, you rascal. So he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? Did he sneak into heaven? No. Is he on earth while this is happening? Yes. But his records are being examined. Where? In heaven. Is this an investigative judgment before the second coming of Jesus? absolutely and clearly and it's taking place in heaven and only when all of the guests have been examined then Jesus can marry his kingdom because his kingdom is complete now how did this man respond well Lord the flesh is weak well Lord I grew up in a bad environment well, Lord, the world was just so attractive. Well, Lord, you just don't know how powerful the devil is. You know, we might give excuses now for our defects and flaws in our character, but we won't then. Romans 3.19 says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be what? Stopped. And all the world may become guilty before God. In Christ's Object Lessons, page 317, Ellen White states, Men may now excuse their defects of character, but in that day they will offer no excuse. The same book, Christ's Object Lessons, page 315 and 316, she says, Many who call themselves Christians are mere human moralists, they have refused the gift which alone could enable them to honor Christ by representing Him to the world. The work of the Holy Spirit to them is a strange work. They are not doers of the Word. 
the heavenly principles that distinguish those who are one with Christ from those who are one with the world have become almost indistinguishable. The professed followers of Christ are no longer a separate and peculiar people. The line of demarcation is indistinct. The people are subordinating themselves to the world, to its practices, its customs, its selfishness. The church has gone over to the world in transgression of the law when the world should have come over to the church in obedience to the law. Daily the church is being converted to the world. All these expect to be saved by Christ's death while they refuse to live his self-sacrificing life. They extol the riches of free grace and attempt to cover themselves with an appearance of righteousness hoping to screen their defects of character but their efforts will be of no avail in the day of God. What a powerful statement. Now you say, are you saying, Pastor Bohr, then, that an individual can be written in the book of life? That an individual can be pardoned? And that afterwards God can revoke what he did? In the judgment? That's exactly what I'm saying. We don't believe in once saved, always saved. Now let me give you another parable of Jesus that illustrates this clearly and explicitly that an individual, if their works show that their acceptance of Christ was a sham, in other words, if the acceptance of Jesus is not translated into a change of the life, forgiveness will be revoked. That is biblical. Notice Matthew chapter 18, verses 23 to 35. Here we have the parable of the two debtors. Ever heard of that parable? Let's read it and interpret it. Matthew 18, 23. Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king, that's God the Father, who wanted to settle accounts, that's the judgment, with his servants, that's us. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him, in other words he didn't come freely, he was brought, who owed him 10,000 talents. By the way, this is such a huge amount that this man could have never paid. He couldn't have paid in 10,000 years. It was an unpayable debt, like we have an unpayable debt before God. Verse 25, But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he should be sold, and his wife and children, and all that he had, and that payment be made. Was that justice? Of course it was justice. He owed the king this. Verse 26, The servant therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Could he really pay? Of course he couldn't. There was no way in his lifetime or a thousand lifetimes that he could pay this, this debt. And so the king does something unbelievable. It says in verse 27, Then the master of that servant was moved with what? compassion. That's God's mercy. That's God's grace. And released him and forgave him that debt. Wow! Is that what Jesus has done with our unpayable debt? He most certainly has. This man appeared to be repentant. He appeared to be sorry. He actually confessed. And he had the willingness to pay. And so you say, this man was saved. His debt was canceled once and for all, forever. Oh. Let's finish the parable. Notice what we find in verse 28. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. By the way, that's the equivalent of a, of, of a hundred days work. It's a payable debt. It could have been done in installments. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat saying, Pay me what you owe. Did his works show that he appreciated the forgiveness that he received for his large debt? Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debt. If you don't forgive, you will not be forgiven. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. And he would not. But he went out and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. 
Did he have the character of the king? Just the opposite. Was he truly repentant? No, he was sorry he was going to go to jail and everything was going to be sold. He was sorry for the consequences, but he wasn't sorry for what he had done in stealing from his master. And so it says in verse 32, Then his master, after he had called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Like we do when we beg for God's grace. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due him. So my heavenly Father also will do to each of you if from his heart he does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Had this be individual been forgiven? Yes or no? He had been forgiven a large debt, but when it was examined how he treated his fellow human being, that forgiveness was what? It was revoked. In other words, it was his life, the way he treated his fellow human beings, that showed whether he truly comprehended and grasped the love and mercy of the king in forgiving his large debt. Are you catching a picture of what's going on here? It's the life that is examined. Now let me explain. It doesn't mean that our works save us, but our works show if we are saved. Amen. We have to, our works are not meritorious because really it's Jesus living in us. You see, imparted righteousness is also Christ's righteousness. It's Him living in us. I am crucified with Christ. I don't live, but Jesus lives in me. It is still His righteousness. When I have His imputed righteousness, and I truly have it, and I understand the large debt that He has forgiven me, it will be a delight for me to live as He lives, and to reflect His character. Verse 13 of the parable. Then the king said to the servants, by the way, these are the angels, bind him hand and foot. Take him away. That is the, the individual who was without a wedding garment, who s was in the wedding hall. He was in the book of life. He claimed to be a follower of Jesus. But it says, bind him hand and foot. Take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And in Matthew 13, verse 30, in the parable of the wheat and the tares, we're told, let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, these are the angels, by the way, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. So let me ask you, does the judgment take place before the second coming of Jesus? Yes or no? Does it take place in heaven? Yes. Is everyone examined? Yes. What is it that is examined? Whether you have what? The robe. And the robe is Christ's imputed righteousness that is revealed in our what? That is revealed in our character, that is revealed in our life. And I praise God that there's going to be a people. Because Jesus says, for many are called, but few are what? Chosen. Let's go to Revelation chapter 17 and verse 14 as we draw this to a close. Revelation 17 verse 14, speaking about the wicked that will try and slay God's people. I want you to notice that there are some that will be with Jesus, that will have accepted this invitation. It says, these will make war with the Lamb. These are the kings of the earth at the end of time. And the Lamb will overcome them, for He is Lord of lords and King of kings. And those who are with Him that is with Jesus, are called, chosen, and faithful. Not only chosen, called, chosen, and they prove to be what? They prove to be faithful to Jesus Christ. So is the Seventh-day Adventist Church wrong when it says that the judgment takes place, that there's an investigative judgment before the second coming of Jesus? In fact, yesterday was October 22. We were celebrating the 166th anniversary of the beginning of the judgment that we talked about this morning. Jesus Himself taught it. 
It's not only in Daniel 8:14 and Revelation chapter 14, 6 and 7. It's found from the very lips of Jesus. And I pray to God that all of us will have that experience of first of all receiving Christ's imputed righteousness truly and that that, well, that will be manifested through a life like His. Amen.